everyone holly and i decided to do a live research uh, update today to inform everyone uh, what she and i have been up to causing trouble in the world of the inform uh, ancient everyone past. Uh, what she and i have been up to sorry about the feedback loop i just caused there by launching my browser ta-da so uh anyway uh holly welcome back it's good to have you thanks i think we've got some interesting research for everyone today and i hope you enjoy it everyone it ties from our research just stemming off of our salem book and connecting it to jan's work with the hippie movement and oh boy does it connect you know 50 ways from sunday every time we you know follow a lead it's like it's connecting right back into the same you know group of people from harvard and uh you know it, it you we're seeing the exact same patterns but today we're going to be getting into uh some more specifics on the the puritans so let's just dive into it and uh you know, first off, you know, uh, any donations we get today, we really appreciate. We've ordered, you know, uh, uh, quite the stack of books, and you know, for research on Salem and all. In fact, there's a whole lot more than that. Any, any, ex uh, any help for expenses? And Holly's got her own stack of books there that she's got and travel and whatnot. And another thing is... Uh, I got uh, my car robbed again the other day, and they got about twelve hundred dollars worth of stuff. The insurance is covering most of it, but the deductible was two fifty. And oh, had a rock hit and break the windshield coming back from Arizona. That was another two hundred and fifteen bucks, and then two hundred books on these books, and another couple of hundred on hers. So we can use all of the the help with uh, funds and research we can possibly get. Um, we want to dive in first off, um, Holly, why don't you dive into the antinomian controversy? Because that's really where the dichotomy begins in this, in this whole, uh, you know, historical fiasco. Okay. So, um, if you're watching now and, uh, if you, even if you don't like have any money to help then um, if you could just share and like the video and maybe someone else who does have the funds will find us. So, you know, we just decided to go live on a Sunday because we've been doing some interesting research. We were looking to the history of the Puritans and how they came to the United States and how they stemmed as a religious group. So I came across something called the antinomian controversy and um, so there's something called divine grace or free grace or uh, uh, they, they had several terms for it, but it was the idea of grace versus um, good acts. So <laughs> well, let's started, go, go yeah. into that. Let's describe that a little bit, what it means, because basically at its root, and I want you to cover this, but at its root, it's the division between... God, God as logos or truth in Christianity, and uh, then the antinomian uh, ideas spins out in in um, in Judaism and in the New Age movement, etc. So antinomianism uh, literally means to be against or opposed to the law. So this stemmed out of Calvinism and Protestantism. So uh, originally, so it, Catholicism would talked about good works. So you were judged by your good acts. Being a good Christian meant doing good works. Well, the antinomians and the Calvinists and the Puritans, all these groups that stemmed from this, thought that it had more to do with grace. So you were predestined by God. It, especially if you had money or acquisitions in this life that God has given you grace. So you can be forgiven for whatever. It doesn't really matter what your, what your acts are. So antinomianism became very popular in the new world. 
And Anne Hutchinson, as some people in the audience might know, she founded Rhode Island. She was a fervent antinomian supporter, and she followed John Cotton. And John Cotton ties back to the Salem witch trials. Right. John Cotton's his grandfather, Cotton Mather's grandfather. Right. So, and then of course, uh, Cotton Mather was one of the uh, presidents of Harvard, etc. Thanks, Bud Cap, for the uh, donation. I hugely appreciate it. We appreciate any donations we can get from the audience right now. You know, we've got way more expenses out uh, in the last week, uh, so all the help Holly and I can get is greatly appreciated. Now, uh, going back to the antinomians, now in my article. In Theogen's What's in a Name, I, sar I, started, I cited uh, Marlene Dobkin de Rios, the famous ethnobotanist from Cal State Fullerton, and she wrote, Substances like ayahuasca create a state of hypersuggestibility in which persons are very open to being influenced by others. Many traditional cultures have utilized this condition to inculcate cultural values and behaviors in young people as they receive initiation into adulthood. In the West, countercultural values can be inculcated in young people when using these psychedelics, especially when using them in an antinomian context. So, <clears throat> you know, right now we're already seeing the bridge between the psychedelic movement and the 1600s Puritans. And this is no joke. And so, you know, for, for 326 years, we've heard this complete and utter nonsense that the Puritans were Christians. This is one of the biggest farces I think I've ever uh, heard. And the more that I've looked into the Puritans, as well as the Protestant Reformation, the whole thing was against logos or, or truth or righteousness, you know, and, and tr truthful behavior uh, as a way to live. And it's everything about its its inversion or its opposite and mark and robert and i did the the show two weeks ago on inversion part one and we'll be doing a part two on that soon but i definitely recommend people follow up with that as well because it explains the whole uh inversion process so this this antinomianism uh, actually and literally became the foundation for do what thou wilt uh, by the Satanist uh, Aleister Crowley, the B666. So, uh, you know, there is a direct connection between antinomian ideals and the Puritans and Crowley and Satanism and free love, etc. So antinomianism is against works-based salvation. So this is where the different uh, sects of Puritanism started to separate. So um, I don't know if you want me to start to jump into that or. Sure. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, you know, why don't we start first off? Let's take a step back. Probably we should put that first. But why don't we go through like the Puritan origins and how they infected everything, you know, like, uh, you know, from the Teutonic Knights. OK, so that's about as far as I can trace it, really. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I think uh, when I started to look at Puritanism coming uh, from Europe, you know, to the United States in England, it was called antinomianism. In the Dutch colonies, it was called Arminianism. So you can find branches of this type of Puritanism spread into the different, um, I guess you could call them nations of Europe at the time. And before that, it stemmed from the Commonwealth or from Parliament, or it goes back to the Magna Carta, this type of um, use of promoting, basically it's kind of, people think of it as like modern day communism. So the Commonwealth and the Magna Carta, if you look into what that was about, it's no taxation without representation. So the overarching theme is to basically have this group go against the monarchy and natural law, if you really want to get into that. And then it seems that the Magna Carta, which when I was in school, I was taught that it was, you know, liberating to the people. And that's what 
America's democracy, republic democracy was based off of. But once you start to look at it from this Puritan angle, you see that both sides are usually controlled, going back to Teutonic era. Right. And so then the, the Magna Carta becomes the parliament, and then they use these things to then take away, uh, let's say, you know, culture building behavior and use it to promote degenerate behavior via laws like we see with the promotion of, you know, banning, uh, you know, if, if you go to jail if you wrong, use the wrong gender pronoun for somebody who makes up, you know, whatever gender that they are, etc., uh, so we see all of these things leading to this, you know, even free speech we can see being used to undermine certain cultural values like uh, what's his name uh, from Hustler magazine when he used free speech to, you know, to publish more and more porn, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> Larry Flint. So you're talking about yeah, Larry Fr Flint. And thank you, uh, King TL, for your donation as well i you know we really appreciate all the support anyone uh please support and donate it's funny you know we're just getting we always have these uh, silly trolls who thumb down the this show it's like you have we haven't even started hardly and they're already thumb downing the the episode it's like you know people seriously need to grow up and go get a life i call them the joe trolls you know but um <laughs> anyway let's uh let's um get on here so let's let's talk about marymount now the the puritans you know and, and uh Amin is is having a bit of a fit there uh but Hi. it's all right um so marymount was an offshoot of the puritans you want to cover that holly okay so i think we touched a little bit on this in our last update but I found out about a colony that was originally called Mount Wollaston, and it's now in Quincy, Massachusetts, but it was called Marymount, and his name was Thomas Morton. He was a Puritan who founded his own colony after Wollaston was kicked out, and they erected a maypole in 1628, and people were supposedly complaining that there was, you know, drunkenness and dancing and uh, uh, getting along with uh, Native women, etc., and just causing, causing a ruckus. So the Puritans had to go in and shut it down, even though uh, Thomas Morton himself was a Puritan and all these people were also Puritans. And then Thomas Morton was thrown out a bunch of times, came back, thrown out, came back, and finally, he ended up advocating for the Massachusetts Bay Corporation and the Massachusetts Bay Colony to fuse together into the Massachusetts Commonwealth. So he created the fusion of basically communism and corporatism, which Puritanism had pushed for from the very beginning. And then uh, we should also point out that he was the lawyer who broke the original Massachusetts Bay Colony Charter by the Pilgrims, I believe, to promote the one by the Puritans. Now, the Pilgrims were, in fact, Christians. The, the, the Pil Pilgrims were Christians. The Puritans were actually uh, Jews who had, quote-unquote, converted to Puritanism during... Judaism's outlaw in Europe for human sacrifice, and they were doing Kabbalistic sophistry. There was a lot of other stuff going on, usury, etc. Um, you, you know, people can look up historically. There's a number of, uh, quite a number of court documents still available of what was going on. Of course, today it's all downplayed, and and what was really happening. So. So this guy, Thomas Morton, and I mentioned this in a show recently, I believe, or posted somewhere that I thought that Timothy Leary was an amalgamation of Thomas Morton at Marymount. And whom else did I say? Uh, now I'm forgetting. You also said Cotton, oh, Cotton Mather. Mather. Right. So and then I did, in fact, find uh, citations uh, for Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters directly citing Thomas Morton as the foundation of their origins. So 
Now we have yet another. So we already talked about Marlene de Rios. Now we have Ken Kesey tying to Thomas Morton. And again, I think that Leary, uh, of course, you know, Leary and these guys were all out of the psychology and social relations department at Harvard. Harvard is in Massachusetts where all of this stuff went down and it, you know, it all ties together. It's such a, a ridiculous little, uh, you know, a cell once you get in there and you start seeing what they're doing. But, you know, studying the inversion and their techniques is really key to understanding uh, how uh, they did things. So now what we have is Marymount branches off from the Puritans, and we know it's it's a Puritan sect. They're just, they're, they're the perverted Puritans, let's say. And then those become the merry pranksters and the, the, the 60s psychedelic revolution be, being promoted by uh timothy leary etc in fact you know i can probably even bring up the the database here and start going into some of these but uh let's see we had uh let's go into uh marymount and so this is the wollaston uh, uh colony and we can see you know it, and we're going to go into some of this but they're tied in with uh may day utopianism communism they're the english dissenters and then they create the the merry pranksters. They're involved in maypole rituals and all of this stuff, like Holly just mentioned. And uh, you know, so again, it, it's like we think that these are disconnected historical events, but what we're seeing is it's the exact same stuff happening in the six, late 1600s, and again in the you know 1960s. And then we can also see patterns of it happening in the uh, 17 and 1800s as well. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of these Puritan groups were interested in something called Christian Hebraism. And I, I think this also connects in with, um, you know, Christian Zionism as we move forward with like the history of Christianity in the United States and Protestant religion. So a lot of them are calling for like the end times, end of the world. And they always also promote, so the Puritans, you know, they have the, we have this idea of like the Puritan work ethic and uh, strict, strict rules and um, Puris, Puritanism really making and founding America. While at the same time, they're also promoting all this degeneracy. And so 1628 was Marymount, but there was also the English Commonwealth under Cromwell, and that didn't happen until a few years later. So this was 1649 that the Commonwealth took a hold after originally it was King James who wanted to reform the English church back to its Christian roots. And his son, Charles I, and his wife wanted to ban the Puritans from England because they were just causing havoc in England. So Cromwell, who was a Puritan, launched his war and subsequently his religious psyops, as we see in 1649. And in 1960. Now, you know, th officially when you read through all of these books like uh, this one, New Israel, New England, Jews and Puritans in Early America, <clears throat> most of these books use this nonsense term Christian Hebraism because they want to... They want the public to think that it's Christians to pre pretending to be Jews. But when you realize that Judaism was outlawed at the time in most countries, except for Germany, Holland, and, uh, uh, and they, were okay, they were allowed as Puritans in England at the time. But, you know, you get that it's inverted. So more properly, this is Hebraic Christianism. So what we're going to do is we're going to invert their inversion back uh, properly to the way it should properly be. So it's Christian, it's Hebraic Christianism or pseudo Christians. It's Jews pretending to be Christians, and then they're doing this behavior, and then pointing at the at the Christians as it's the Christians doing it. So it's constantly the same inversion that we showed, you know, a few weeks ago. So um, you know, we we see this this exact same tactic happening uh, throughout history. Now, 
uh, uh, thanks again for the donations for this episode. Again, you know, uh, we mentioned at the start of the show, and there's a lot of people watching now. Uh, I, I was robbed, uh, this week out of my car. They stole about 1200 bucks worth of stuff. So there's a $250 deductible, uh, windshield got shattered from a semi truck coming back from the grand Canyon, another 215 plus we've got several hundred bucks wrapped up in books. So, you know, we ask, uh, everyone for any donations and support you can offer. We really appreciate it. Maybe we should sit here and beg for money for like five minutes until we get a, like a uh, hundred dollar donation from someone like uh, Pacifica would do or something that's cruel. Um, but uh, so, you know, another, so there, so there wasn't just one offshoot group of the Puritans, there were others. So Holly, do you want to discuss the diggers? Okay. So what happened here when Cromwell took over and uh, Charles the first was publicly beheaded and, um, he, you know, this was called regicide. And so the Commonwealth took over and basically, you know, Cromwell was declared, you know, de facto ruler of England. And after this happened, um, I'm trying to remember what his name, Manessa, Manessa bin Israel. I, for, I should have pulled him up. He worked with Cromwell. They legalized, you know, Judaism within England um, and they allowed um, Judaism to be legalized in the Caribbean. So that's how it connects into Barbados and Jamaica. And Jan has been doing some great research on pirates and lots of other stuff connecting to the Puritans. So as they spread into New England and um, across England, they split up in 1649, originally into like three or four different groups. One was called uh, the Levelers, one was called the Ranters, and we have the Diggers. And, you know, lo and behold, I had read something that they inspired some of the hippie movement in the 1960s. And I was like, Jan, have you ever heard of this, like the Levelers or the Diggers? And he's like, yeah, I already have them in the database. So, so there was another connection that we found. Right, so. yeah. So yet another connection between the... the uh absurd ridiculousness and thanks lex van and um brian for the uh quick chat uh, snapchat whatever it's called donations just now really appreciate that so a few years ago i was researching the diggers and i posted a little funny thing on facebook the other day just kind of going into all of this but so in uh the 1960s there was this group of uh, scumbags some of them were still around uh, one of them was peter C uh, uh and that's just my opinion excuse me for uh, any of you uh uh of those happy with their litigious nature uh one was uh peter C uh, coyote coyote who's the uh of course movie star and documentary narrator documentary film narrator and he was a member of the new left of course uh you know, for those, you know, Peter Coyote is a pretty famous uh, actor. There's plenty of movies out there with him in it. Uh, he even did like the, the voiceover in Jack Harris Hemp, you know, video years ago. Part of the Village Voice people with Allen Ginsberg and Ezra Pound and, and all of these people. So, you know, tied with the Greenwich, uh, Greenwich Village uh, MK Ultra team. Uh, run by the CIA out of Greenwich Village with all of these uh, agents and troublemakers there. Of course, uh, Alistair Crowley was in there, uh, Daniel Pinchbeck, uh, Jack Kerouac, Joyce Johnson, Daniel's uh, mother, Ronald uh, Stark Shitsky, the uh, uh, LSD manufacturer and dealer and uh, killer. And uh, <clears throat> so this is the diggers, <clears throat> excuse me, and then... Uh, so we've got Peter Berg here, and it gets back into this Black Bear Ranch up, I think it's in Northern California, uh, where they have all of this stuff going on. I think it was Yeshi or Osha Numa, and these guys were all involved in, in running this. But these are these, you know, connects into these 60s communes. And again, there's another tie between these. So it's these diggers. And again, we had Mary Mount with the Mary Pranksters. So we can see this group tying into one of these 60s communes that uh, still runs today. Yeah, it's in uh, uh, 
Siskiyou County, California, if uh, anybody wants to go up on that. And uh, Peter Coyote uh, involved in that as well. So there's yet another connection. And um, so getting back to uh, the diggers, that also ties into Emmanuel uh, Trujillo. And uh, that gets into the Native American church and some of these other groups. But uh, uh, he is Mana True Hill Cochise. There's evidence that he may have been an agent or something uh, as well and faking a lot of the stuff. And that's him there. Mana is cool. And uh, more ties to Leary in the database for those who want to investigate that. Tied to Walter Boart, Peggy Mellon Hitchcock, who, of course, of the Mellon Banking Empire, her brother Billy funded the Millbrook Mansion, uh, which of course Billy or Tim Leary, Walter Boart, et cetera, were all at. Uh, I think I, Andrew Weil may have been there as well, uh, but uh, I may be wrong on that. But he apparently knew him as well, and so all of these things start looping back, and we get these cycles of these things happening over the uh, you know over centuries. And we see that it's, you know, that these programs didn't start as, say, we originally thought with, like, the War of the Worlds program. I mean, it's actually going back several centuries further than we had originally uh, believed on this. So, uh, Jan, can I, can I jump in about sure. just defining what those groups were back in the 1600s? Absolutely. Okay, so in the late 1640s, when the Commonwealth was established in England, the three main groups were the levelers, the diggers, and the ranters. And original, and uh, eventually they turned into the Quakers, which you might recognize, audience, and a group called the Fifth Monarchists. So uh, levelerism produced demonstrations, thousand, several thousand people strong throughout London. They provoked serious mutinies in the new model army and occasioned, quote, genuine anxiety among members of the rump parliament. That was the condensed parliament that Oliver Cromwell put into power during his commonwealth. And then the diggers were involved in experimental communism. So they were the ones who were literally going into public land, like church land, and digging and that's why they were called the diggers, because they were planting and creating uh, communes. And then uh, rant the ranchers were probably the most uh, extreme of the group. They promoted free love, nudity, orgies, drug use, and uh, just general just disarray. And uh, because of them, they, all, they started to put in, the Puritans had to turn against other Puritans and put in blasphemy laws and cut down on free speech, etc. And uh, thank you, Ernesto, for the $100 donation just now. We really appreciate that. And, of course, Holly and I need funds for moving Holly out to California and everything uh, soon. Uh, uh, most of you are already aware that Holly and I did get married last month. So uh, thanks for all of your support and everything on that as well. Um, now, a couple of other points that I want to bring up about the diggers and, you know, the diggers in the 60s, they get really interesting because that gets into the new left as well, like I mentioned. But uh, so, you know, the diggers also tie into another group called the Suicide Society. Now, the Suicide Society. Suicide Society is very important. <laughs> uh, so uh, the reason why they're important is they tie, you know, they're a similar theme to the Merry Pranksters again, which I had n noted in the brain database a couple of years ago when I was mapping this ma out. Uh, they attacked the Mooney cult, interestingly enough. But more interestingly is the Suicide Society becomes ladies and gentlemen, none other than the Cacophony Society. And what is the Cacophony so Society? Uh, the Cacophony <laughs> Society is none other than the group that founded Burning Man. No joke. So Larry Harvey is of the Cacophony Society, started by John Law, Louis M. Brill, Stuart Mangrum, etc., and the Merry Pranksters. It's a form of Discordian Satanism. 
Uh, of course, Discordianism, founded by Robert Anton Wilson of the CIA, Kerry Thornley, etc. And uh, most people don't know that you know all of the all of your major uh, uh, psych- '60s psychedelic heroes. The, all of the big ones were all agents. Um, you know, we've got, of course, uh, Bob Dobbs or Dean Neverett There, you know the the uh, Church of the Subgenius or whatever. He is a Discordian as well. He won't. Uh, he might be. Uh, his ion suggests that he's Office of Navy Intelligence, um, which is a pun on the whole water thing. He won't tell me straight up what agency he works for, but, you know, he's some form of intel, and he claims that he heads the Illuminati these days. That's uh, this guy right here, uh, Bob Dobbs, Dean Neverett, whatever the heck he's called. And, um, you know, that's per our personal exchanges and everything with uh, with this guy. And um, so, you know, we're tied again all the way to Burning Man from this same group of people. So we are actually, ladies and gentlemen, at the historical nexus of all of this stuff coming out of the Jewish Puritans out of uh, Salem, Massachusetts and Massachusetts in general. Now, I want to discuss another group uh, for this and somebody else just donated uh, excuse me sorry about that somebody just donated twenty dollars thank you uh perrier man i we really appreciate that i keep saying i we that's for both of us so thank you and uh so another group that that all connects into let's go back here just a second cacophony diggers all right so now we're going to go back down through the uh, where was it? Uh, okay, let's go down. Hold on, I'm forgetting which one of these is the proper connection here now. Okay, so we're going to get into the Chicago 7 now. That was the yippies, so let me follow it upward here. Okay, so that was the new left, and then uh, Jerry Rubin, and you know these guys that called themselves the diggers of the, of the uh, 1960s, the diggers and the yippies, of course, uh, uh, Walter Board, whom we just mentioned, was one of the first yippies. And, of course, Walter Board was Intel. He wrote Operation Mind Control, which I've already exposed in my article, Spies in Academic Clothing. But uh, Abby Hoffman, he was one of these clowns, and that's him here on the screen. He was one of these clowns that started the Chicago riots. And uh, so that was the Chicago 7. And so this group, again, these are directly tied to the diggers. They're like the modern version of the diggers. And, of course, we see none other than Senator Tom Hayden there. And, of course, he was married to Jane Fonda. And then, you know, that gets into the whole uh, Young Turks and all that. And we can see a whole other movement there. But, again, we're beginning to see the core foundation of these movements in the late 1600s. Oh, and just uh, one more point. Abby Hoffman's motto was... uh, for the youth to kill their parents. How do you like that? You want to take the the next one, Holly? Let's go with, um, why don't we get into the uh, ranters? Okay, so I've got some some handwritten notes here, and I've got some other notes here, but this is all stuff that I have been finding out about um, just like just this week, like just a couple days ago, I stumbled upon the ranters, and um, they started in 1649 with these, I'm just calling them straight up psyops, basically, by, by Cromwell and these Puritan groups. So they rejected heaven. They said that humans are God. They wanted liberalism from all laws. Um, they promoted recreational drugs and swearing, nudity, orgies. So they would talk about free love as in free grace, so divine grace, as I brought up earlier, they, they believe in predestination. So, you know, you're either chosen or you're not, so don't worry about it. And, right, and uh, if you're a chosen person, you're chosen already, right? Yeah, so it doesn't really matter. So they created this uh, uproar within England, and Cromwell had to come come to the rescue of everyone, and the Commonwealth had to pass anti-blasphemy laws and um, other just cutting down on free speech. And then I think, I'm not positive, but I think that this turned into the blue laws, which we have in New England. So Puritanism had to reach back and they 
eventually banned Christmas as well. They disallowed the celebration of Christmas in England during this time because they didn't want any sort of, uh, you know, joyous occasions. And this turned into the idea of like the Quakers, you know, the Quaker meeting, how strict they had to become to fight back against these other crazy Puritans. All right. I don't know if uh, this Confucius character in there is a troll or not. Keep an eye on him if we need to ban him. Uh, obviously, we got some Joe trolls about. Uh, let's see. So uh, let's get into the I want to get into the muggles here for a minute. Now, the muggles or Muggleton, I believe, was actually inverted into the non-magical muggles in the Harry Potter films. And um, so... You know, it's it's again, it's an inversion like we discussed in the show a couple weeks ago. Always this inversion tactic. And uh, let's see. I don't know. who I'm just going to ban this person. I don't know what their deal is or what if they're a good or bad person. I'm just going to remove them. Excuse the interruption <laughs> there. Now, uh, let's see. So I just want to, one thing just for the audience about Muggletonians, the, according to Wikipedia, they say that they avoided all forms of worship or preaching and met only for discussion and socializ, uh, socializing. So um, these groups all split, they split into more groups and more groups. I think there was like eight. Um, they called them all uh, English dissenters. And um, all of this started, it started up quick and kind of fell apart quick, except the Quakers escaped and some of the Puritans escaped to the New World. A lot of them never really took took hold in the New World, and a lot of them were cut off after Charles II took the throne. Yeah, and of course, uh, it was um, Cromwell et al. who, and in fact, uh, they uh, Cromwell is who had the... Uh, had King Charles I of England, who was a Stuart, uh, killed, assassinated, so that they could bring in the Commonwealth and communism in England, as well as in Massachusetts. Again, today, the state of Massachusetts is still called the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, reflecting all of this. And, of course, Harvard at all is still promoting this, you know, this same... Uh, communist agenda whether it's leary or james fadiman or you know ram das uh who's uh, uh richard alpert etc all of these clowns out of the cia's uh harvard social relations department uh, under henry a murray et al and we know that uh there you know that that department is still big in the mind control but here is the, the people who had King Charles I uh, de uh, beheaded, and uh, then they brought in King Charles II, I think, after they had probably corrupted and controlled him. But uh, basically, they needed to get out the power of natural law and uh, those who ruled by logos or truth and bring in communism and antinomianism and all of these things because, of course, they did not believe in truth. They did not believe truth existed which therefore Logos did not exist, and if truth did not exist, God could not exist. So anyone who tells you truth doesn't exist is actually a Satanist by definition. You know, that's an interesting one. So again, everyone, thank you for um, the, the donations today. We're trying to cover expenses from mishaps, uh, $1,200 robbery this week, uh, stole a bunch of stuff. Of course, another pair of my glasses were stolen with that. I don't know what is with people who steal from my car. I have had no less than four pairs of glasses stolen out of my car when I've left them in overnight. So I've got to go down and pay for a new doctor's visit and all of that and a new prescription to get the, the glasses replaced. So all of that is much appreciated. Broken windshields, etc. Hundreds of dollars spent on all of these lovely books to figure out this massive historical scandal i mean even we haven't even gone into that yet the plague and the fire my goodness and uh reckless rights boy this is another one the purim and the legacy of jewish violence if you want to get into the real origins of of the puritans and of course they want us to believe that it's about 
purification and not Purim. Of course, the Purim were are Jews who celebrate the uh, slaughter of 75,000 Persians under Haman, and they, they have this uh, annual celebration of this massive uh, human sacrifice ritual that they, that they did. And uh, so, let's see. Uh, Holly, again, we're back at 1649. You want to get into the fifth monarchists? Um, well, I want to say a couple of things. I will talk about fifth monarchists. Um, was someone in the chat brought up uh, class, so the intersection of class here. So I have found that these groups are constantly called the merchant class, and that's why uh, parliament was popular. And basically the Magna Carta took over as well. It was like the merchant class coming up and trying to usurp the power of the monarchy. And so the merchant class was promoted by uh, Puritanism through divine grace and predestination. You know, if you were doing monetarily well, then you are obviously chosen by God. And as well as uh, banning Christmas, they also cracked down on alms to the poor. So they prom promoted this idea of, you know, a Puritan or Protestant work ethic, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps and let's not offer alms to the poor anymore. So uh, that also caused riots within England because it just went after centuries of uh, how the English had lived as Christians. So uh, you had mentioned the levelers as well, and we touched on them a bit, but they were tied in with the suffrage movement. So a lot of people don't really think that 1649, they'd be talking about suffrage because we think of that as something that happened, you know, in the new world, and then it didn't happen until like the 1800s. But we see the foundation of it starting under the levelers and uh, in 1649. Now, lots of talk about the Magna Carta in the chat here, and uh, people are saying it was nonsense because it was null and void. Now, we have to realize that it was used to undermine rule by logos uh, which came down from the D divine right of kings which if you want to read an example of a proper emperor or king you would want to read a book like uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations as that would be like a true king who lived under logos and truth and did everything by honor and everything and this is what they don't want people to grasp so you know the Magna Carta was all about using it, you know, uh, no taxation without representation, et cetera, uh, you know, th and free speech and all of these things. These were used to promote these undermining of the, these, you know, the ability to undermine society from Logos. And it was sold as free speech, women's liberation and all of this stuff. And, of course, they had to hype that women were were suppressed and and when you get into what logos was it, you know they've they've spun the whole thing they've inverted everything all the way through um so can see. i jump Did, in about the fifth monarchists oh yeah i thought yeah okay go ahead sorry okay so the fifth monarchists the fifth monarchists and the quakers came out after the what they called 1649 to 1660 and our cromwell was called the interregnum interregnum sorry if i'm saying that wrong that was following the english civil wars so the interregnum was the cromwell commonwealth years so the fifth monarchy believed that there were four ancient monarchies before the babylonians the persians the macedonians and the romans and that they needed the puritans to take over to bring in revelation end of the world and the return of Christ. So they thought that 1666 would be the year of revelation and uh, indicating the number of the beast. And of course, as we did, we talked about briefly and you showed your book, the plague and the fire 1666 was both the year that there was a massive unknown plague throughout London that wiped out a massive number of people in London and then there was a giant fire, the Great Fire of 1666 in London. And basically the whole of the city of London had to come out of that. And 
uh, old London was rebuilt as a city state pretty much. Right. You know, and a lot of this is hard for people to understand because they're so used to hearing how wonderful the Magna Carta is and all of these things. And they don't, you know, they haven't, they don't, first of all, they don't understand logos. They don't understand uh, Marcus Aurelius. Of course, uh, you know, and Robert and I were talking about this re uh, recently, Robert Rowe, who's been on the show several times, uh, that, uh, and he brought this up, that Stoicism was created uh, to make the illusion that Stoicism and Christianity were separate when, when it's, you know, when you get what Logos is, that is Christianity, and anything that's inverted away from that isn't. So when somebody does behavior against that, that's obviously not Christianity, you know, so you can't blame the Christians for something that was done out of Logos, and that's the, you know, what people need to understand when they get into this stuff. So Chad, uh, you know, I hope that helps uh, you, you begin to understand this. But the whole process of what we've been told is inverted, and they use this, uh, the Magna Carta, et cetera, to promote this degeneracy throughout history. And it's like when you start reading and looking at this stuff, you have to start questioning many of your core beliefs of, you know, what we've been told throughout history. I mean, Holly and I are, like, daily having to question things that we thought was you know, true since we were like in fifth grade or whatever in, in some BS social studies class, you know? Yeah, it's kind of hard. I mean, I went to school for political science, got my my bachelor's in political science. And, you know, I have I really love like the, and, and I'm fascinated by the Revolutionary War era and early American history. And, you know, we're all taught to love the founding fathers and the, you know, the Bill of Rights. And then I started to notice as we're looking into this, like the same groups and the same people keep popping up. And we've talked about Ben Franklin several times in previous episodes. And he was a Quaker, of course, and his family was directly tied in with pamphleteering, which all of these groups, the ranters, levelers, diggers, all these people are based around pamphleteers. So that's where the PR uh, section starts to come in and you you also see the American Revolution era, the end of the Salem witch trials, I think, in, in my mind, launched the Enlightenment era, and then that launched the revolutionary period in the United States and in France. So I haven't completely figured this out yet, but it's all starting to point in that direction. Yeah, we're starting to get some more trolls in here. Now, Chad, I guess, you know, Chad, uh, you know, when we're talking about inversion, it's a, he says it's a fancy way of saying lying. No, that's actually very separate. Under lying, you have hundreds of different fallacies. And inversion is a specific type of lie where you invert something. Now, unlocking the power here, I'm guessing, is probably a troll. They're, uh, they use the same, uh, always the same stuff, always the All same right. comments. <laughs> So, I don't know. Let's just block that. We don't need the Satanists in here. Bye-bye. I mean, if they want to give us, like, five bucks or something, that'd be cool. But... All right, I'll put them on a timeout. But if you're promoting Satanism and anti-truth rhetoric, and, and if you're going to say that they're all the same and you haven't even bothered to read them yourself, you don't belong here. We, we You know, we like an audience that's educated. I put them yeah, on timeout. Uh, someone in the chat also talks about uh, Freemasonry, too. And, of course, this always completely is an overarching theme amongst all this. You know, all, the, all these groups, all these individuals are seeing their Puritans, their pamphleteers. They have some connection to Harvard. They're connected to the Freemasons. Like, yeah, you can take a look at that. You can look in uh, Jan's database brain for that as well and just go for that. Yeah, we're going to move on from Chad. He's not grasping some of this. It's all right. I, I know it's a lot to understand. The Emancipation Proclamation he brought up, it's probably more like, yeah, that is another really inversion because they didn't really free. You know, when you look at the Emancipation, the slaves were really freed out of the South so that they could be moved in, as slave, you know, or cheap labor into the factories in the Industrial Revolution in the North. And uh, it was just a moving of uh, people, and then they destroyed the South and bankrupted it, et, et cetera. And that's a whole other thing to get into. But you have to realize who originally uh, brought the slaves in. Of course, that was the Puritans and Rhode Island and the Antinomians, the do-what-thou-wilt, the Satanists. Those were who brought the, 
the slaves in. And of course, that's all been spun against the Christians. As anybody who knows who's read the book, uh, you're not supposed to enslave uh, Christians. So um, now going into the last of these notes here, let's see. So we've, we, yeah, we've kind of, I guess that we've kind of already covered it all. So um, those were all the key points that we wanted to discuss. Um, you know, again, thank you everyone for your donations and support. It's been a rough week and we still have more research to do. We need to plan another trip back to Salem very soon, as soon as we get the funds for that. Um, Holly is going to be out here next week and then... Uh, we're going to uh, be working more on the book. We're trying to get the book done in months, but we keep discovering more and more and more. So how quick we get it done is a good question. How can you enslave non-Christians? Well, if you live in Logos and Truth, anyone who is not in Logos and Truth is technically a slave, but that's a whole other subject to get into that would require you doing lots of reading. Uh, and, of course, as somebody's bringing up Magna Carta, Bill of Rights, you know, the Bill of Rights came out of the Magna Carta. And, again, it's like you know, when you get how they invert these things to use them against us but sell them to us as good things, rights. I mean, your, free, your right to speak freely should be self-evident. But all of this stuff is constantly being inverted. It's an, it's an actual inversion of the fact you flip it over. Of course, there's ad hominem attacks or... Or, uh, you know, slippery slope fallacy, poisoning the well, red herrings, all of these different fallacies that we've taught and talked about with the Trivium for, year, for years. But if people go back to the show two weeks ago on inversion, that is a very specific type of fallacy or lie. See, yeah, Chad Warren is still confused over things. Let's just forget that guy. Um, so anyway, you know, it's like you get caught into the uh, free man movement and anarchy. The anarchy is comes out of the antinomians. And when you realize that society needs laws and rules to function properly, you don't have pedophiles running in the, in the streets. You know, the, the libertarians love to sell drugs and porn and all of this stuff without any uh, repercussions for the damage it does to other people and family and society as a whole. And you can start to see how these things are used and promoted. But you have to, you know, if you ask the wrong questions, you'll, you'll never get to it. You know, if you set up all your questions assuming that you already have the answer, you'll never, you'll never come to a different uh, conclusion. So just a follow-up for the audience, if you want to do some research on your own, I just recommend you just type in antinomian controversy and just look at that from a perspective of founding the United States. This is how a lot of the American colonies were founded, especially in New England. And it talks about just a modern philosophy and ties into the Enlightenment. So I'm pretty happy that we stumbled upon that because it creates a larger uh, uh, subtext, I guess, for us to explore the Salem witch trials and the book that we're working on. <laughs> right. You know, and I'm, I'm really glad that you came up with that because, you know, in uh, what was it, 2014, I had written about antinomianism in my article and I had defined it there, realizing that they were ta attacking Christianity and how they had flipped everything but when you get in there and you understand this whole antinomian thing and how all of these different groups stem out of the Puritans and the Puritans came out of, uh, you know, out of outlawed Judaism in Europe from the stuff that was going on there, then you begin to see the whole picture playing out uh, repeatedly throughout history. So... So someone in the chat's bringing up pirates. So I think that might have to be one of the, the next shows. And also, uh, Jan found some really fascinating research about how the, the town of Salem and how wealthy it was and all of the, oh, yeah. the merchant ships there and all the underground tunnels that you found. So um, that'll be some further research that we do. And even, yeah, so we're going to go so far as secret tunnels tying in with the Salem Witch Trials. Right now, guys, I don't so. know if that book was stolen, though. It's just not in the stack here. Hopefully it's out in the car somewhere. But, um, yeah, so, and Holly pointed this out. So 
Uh, Salem, now I discovered that Salem, and we had showed a book on screen, Salem was the richest town in America, but it wasn't just the richest town. Other places considered Salem like a country unto its own. So it would be like uh, Washington, D.C., City of London, uh, Morocco. Um, you know, what are some of the others that you came up with? The Vatican. The Vatican, right. So, so it was that wealthy. And, you know, when you read these official histories by, you know, by the roaches and whatnot out there that publish the disinfo, uh, they want you to believe, you know, I, I shouldn't say that, you know, I haven't finished reading that book specifically, but in general, uh, caveat, uh, what they want you to think is that, like, you know, the Puritans and the people living in Salem were these dumb morons and they... You know, they lived in little shacks and they didn't have anything. And they're like, eh, you know, you know, just like milking the cow, churning the butter like a like a Weird Al Yankovic uh, tune or something like that. And um, and that this is the foundation of all of this. But <clears throat> when you get in and you understand that, you know, that the whole history is fake, that this was the wealthiest city in America, that Harvard, you know, was behind all of this with the Royal Society. They're promoting inoculations they're promoting um you know this whole antinomian theme then you can begin to grasp and see what's going on and i know that so much anti-logos propaganda has been promoted since salem that people are just caught in this same mindset that hey you know we should attack you know rather than questioning why everyone attacks christianity and logos figure out what it is by reading and studying yourself firsthand. So I'm done. If you know, Holly, do you have anything to, else to add? No, I think that's a good way to wrap up for tonight. I, I mean, that's, there's so many topics that we could jump into about our, our book. So this is just a, just another way that we were able to tie the Puritan era back to your research on the hippie movement. All right. So, and uh, we'll we'll follow up with an in depth, more in depth on all of this stuff uh, soon. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you all soon. Bye bye.